Thank you very much, Mr. President. I am honored and happy to have the opportunity to deliver a talk which so directly complements the speech that you've just given. I'd like to begin with three stories. The first begins in 1976, a time when I, as a young teenager, was obsessed with this institution. Not because I was a communist, indeed I was a right-wing nut. I was a fan of Ronald Reagan at the time, so it wasn't my own personal predilection, but it was a fascination that I had first learned in June of 1976 when I visited this extraordinary country and saw the campaign around this institution. And the fascination with the passion of this institution and the campaign in Italy led me six years later to make a trek as a college student across the full part of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet republics. And as some of you might remember at the time, the way you traveled in these parts of the countries was that you carried tokens of the West, for example, chewing gum and cigarettes, which you gave as gifts as you traveled around this part of the world. Well, when I came to Bulgaria, the last of the countries that I was traveling, I came across a playground where there were children playing. And I went to the playground to offer them chewing gum. And I was astonished that these children took the gum and had no idea what I was handing them, had never seen it before, had no conception of what this was. So cut off they were from the rest of the West. Now, I was reminded of this in 2005 when I had the opportunity to travel back to Bulgaria and give a lecture at this extraordinary place, the Red House in Sofia. And at this lecture, I spoke to many young people from Bulgaria. And what I found was they were in 2005 no different from young people anywhere in the West. They were more clueful about issues around the internet that indeed my colleagues at the University of California and at Stanford were back home. That's the first story. Here's the second. 2003, I was invited to come to a conference held by Viacom, one of the leading media companies in the world, at this extraordinarily beautiful place in Scottsdale, Arizona. It was a conference where I was to contribute to a conversation about copyright protection and technology. But as I was known as the copyright anarchist, at least among this group of people, it was more like throwing me as a young Christian into the Colosseum, as the very top leaders of Viacom felt that it was their duty to beat me up in front of the rest of the Viacom executives. So Sumner Redstone lectured me ferociously about how ill conceived my own ideas were, and this executive was so extreme that he felt it necessary to send me a formal apology after the event for his extraordinary behavior. But after my intervention and my scolding by the senior executives of Viacom, a bunch of junior executives took me aside, leaders of the black uh, uh, station at Viacom and other important young music stations. And they said to me, you need to understand, this is China. And we wait till they die, and then we will take over. And finally, in 2001, I had a beginning of an association with a large number of young French students about issues related to free software and free culture. And my conception of France and these issues was formed through my experience with these young French students. And then just this last year, I was invited to an event in Avignon at the Palace of Popes, where I was asked to give a speech to the leaders of the French cultural industry and the French culture ministry. And I gave this speech, and I was welcomed after the speech with an extraordinary and astonished response. Indeed, the leader of the event told me, Mine was a brilliant talk, maybe the best he'd ever heard, but he disagreed with absolutely everything that I said. 
Now, I was frankly astonished because I had said nothing which any sane person in the world could possibly have disagreed with. My contribution was as banal and ordinary as it possibly could be. So I wanted to understand what was it that led these people to be so far removed that they thought they could disagree with anything I had said. So I followed the leaders to this event to be held at the University of Avignon, a debate with the students. And on the stage were arrayed about nine leaders from French media industry. And in the audience were about 300 students. And one by one, students got up and asked the leaders of the French culture industry questions about the internet, questions that seemed to me obvious about the capacity and the potential for this network. And one by one, the students were corrected and scolded by the leaders on the stage because of their misconceptions about the, what the future was. And indeed, one leader said that it is my job, quote, to defend the dying ways, which led a student next to me to lean to his friend and say, ever the dream of the dinosaurs. Three stories. Here's the point. The divide that we see in the world today is less a divide about nations and more a divide about generations. The separation that Generation Y has among each of the different countries where Generation Y lives is less than the separation that the rest of us have in the different cultures within which each of us live. The gap between them, regardless of their country, is less than the gap between us, even us from Western Europe in the United States, and the gap between us and them is large and growing. As we legislate for us in the face of this gap, we increasingly legislate against them. But we need to remember to recognize it is the way of nature we won't beat them. And the only question is how they will remember us, whether they'll remember us as I remember this man or as we remember these people as dinosaurs in an age that is dying and past. So this is an event to celebrate the web, what I think of more as the internet. To understand the internet, we have to understand first what the internet is not. We don't understand the internet by thinking about particular applications any more than you would understand the importance of the printing press by thinking about particular books or the importance of the market theorized by Adam Smith if you thought about the particular commodities that were bought and sold within the market. The internet, the thing the internet is, is a thing that enables, just like the market enables, the printing press enables, the internet enables. What it is, is an architecture to enable unplanned and unforeseen innovation. Innovation, what others call freedom, innovation. Now, what kind of innovation? Well, if humans were just good, the innovation would be just good. But I don't have to be a professor to remind you we're not just good. Our societies are mixed between good and evil, and here too and everywhere there is good and evil. So there is good on the internet, entities like Google and Facebook and even iTunes, and though it's questioned in some parts of the world, even YouTube, good on the internet. And then there's entities that are bad on the internet. Viruses and spam and zombie bots that take over computers and make them controllable at a distance and malware in general. These things are awful and destructive across the network. Now we cheerleaders for the internet, as I have been too many times spend too much of our time praising the good and forgetting the bad. And it is time we remember both the good and the bad in understanding how 
the internet becomes the society we will live. So here are three places to remember it. In the context of copyright, the context of journalism, and in the context of the increasing push for transparency throughout society. First with copyright. There's good in the contribution that the internet has made to the creative industries of the world. The internet has pushed innovation, and that innovation has created enormous diversity in the culture that's accessible to people everywhere. Professional diversity, as my colleague Chris Anderson describes through the dynamic of the long tail, the internet enables a much wider range of commercial culture to succeed than it could before. But it also enables amateur cultural creativity. And by amateur, I don't mean amateurish. I mean people who create for the love of the art and not for the money. The importance of amateur creativity was an obsessive concern of this professional creator, John Philip Sousa, who in 1906 traveled to the United States Congress to talk about the scourge of the industry in his mind, the talking machine. This is what Sousa had to say. These talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy, in front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. Today you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left, Sousa said. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man as he came from the ape. Now this is the picture I want you to focus on. This picture of young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. The picture of people participating in the creation and the recreation of their culture. Sousa was right to fear the survival of that image of culture in the 20th century as technologies like vinyl and broadcast turned us into a passive couch potato culture. But he is wrong about the technologies of the 21st century, technologies that are radically reviving the very conception of culture that he was celebrating. Let me give you three examples. I'm sure some of you in this room have seen this extraordinary performance of Pachelbel's Canon in D. It's on YouTube. Since it's been posted, more than 70 million people have seen it. This performance is a performance of a young kid with a baseball cap and his own variation. Another example. Some kid took music and these videos and put them together to produce Yo! this. Soldier Boy, tell me. Hey, I got this new damn for y'all called a Soldier Boy. You got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Uh, uh, Boy, that then inspired someone else to produce this. Yo! Soldier Boy, tell me. Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. You just gotta punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Uh, Which then inspired someone else to take, produce this. Soldier Boy, what's up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. You just gotta punch, then crank back three times from left to uh, right. Here's another example. Some fan of the Brat Pack took the Brat Pack videos and 
set it to this remix music video of the song Listomania. decided they'd try to make the same video. So sentimental. Of course, anything that Brooklyn can do, San Francisco can do better. what Sousa romanticized when he spoke of the young people getting together and singing the songs of the day of the old songs. But rather than getting together in a corner in the backyard, what they do is they get together on a free digital platform that links people from around the world and inspires creativity from people around the world. It is because of the architecture of this platform and because of laws which enable the freedom of this platform, that this creativity can happen. And if the same rules that apply to old forms of media were applied to this platform, it would make this creativity impossible. Indeed, YouTube uploads in every one minute 20 hours of video. Indeed, in the time since I began my talk today, there has been more than 12 days of video uploaded to YouTube. Any rule that would require preclearance of that content would be a rule that required sites like YouTube to close. That is the good that has come from this infrastructure of creativity. But there has been bad as well. The piracy, the peer-to-peer -peer piracy of copyrighted works by copyright owners who don't authorize their sharing, no doubt that has produced harm. There's extreme statements of the harm. The RAAA has, in my view, an unfounded claim of $12 billion in economic losses every year. But you don't have to believe the extremes to recognize that even though digital sales has radically increased in the last five years, the music market as a whole has decreased. And while it would be corruption to use government power simply to protect an industry, in my view, it is perfectly appropriate for the government to worry about the harm to artists. And there is no doubt, in my view, that at least this piracy has harmed at least some of these artists. That is a bad from this platform of innovation. Or think about it in the context of journalism. There's extraordinary good from the internet for journalism. It comes from the innovation, the diversity of new forms of journalism, both professional as sites enable an extraordinary collection of journalistic articles accessible at a single click, and amateur sites like Wikipedia or blogs that eventually themselves become commercial because the demand for them is so great. All of this is good, but there is bad here too. The rise of the free media, the free access to journalism, no doubt puts pressure on a certain kind of journalism that is essential for democracy, investigative journalism. If our image of great journalism is set by examples like this, the New York Times publishing the Pentagon Papers, it represents a brief moment in the history of the press where the press had a spine, where the press stood up to government and the courts defended their courage. This moment had a profound effect on our imagination of what the press could be and a profound effect on history. I fear in my country that time is over. Even if there are papers still, 
there is not the same spine in those papers to defend the truth against government power. Think just about the story around the way that same paper withheld the facts around Iraq until the election of President Bush was confirmed. Now, no doubt, the internet will increase the pressure on this form of journalism as the cross-subsidy that newspapers provided falls. And no doubt that is a profound problem for democracy. Or finally, think about the context of transparency. There's extraordinary good the internet has produced here as well. Again, innovation, enormous benefits in the explosion of efficiency and accountability that access to data, especially data from the government, will produce. The Obama administration has been a leader in framing simple ways that government data will be made extraordinarily efficiently accessible. Data.gov, a new site that takes a wide range of government data sets and makes them completely free for people to take and build on as they wish. And before this administration, data, for example, about the efficiency of cars are simple ways that consumers can use to begin to drive towards more efficient consumption of precious fossil fuels. And in Britain, too, sites like They Work For You constantly put pressure on the government by the transparent data they make available about how the Parliament and Westminster functions. Without doubt, the vast majority of these projects are fantastically good for democracy, essential for democracy. But there are costs here, too. There is a dark side to this transparency movement. So here's an example. You might not have seen this film released just in the United States, Maxed Out. It's a story of credit card debt in the United States. Many dimensions to this problem, but one important cause of this problem is a statute called the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of 2005. It's a little bit of a typo. There's no consumer protection in this act at all. It is an act only to benefit the banks. But the effect of this statute was to make it effectively impossible to discharge credit card debts. So companies like Bank, uh, Bethlehem Steel could use bankruptcy to escape pension obligations. Enron could use bankruptcy to escape power obligations. But you cannot escape credit card obligations in the United States. You will carry these obligations forever. Now, this statute was first proposed when President Clinton was president. He originally was in favor of that statute. But his wife read an op-ed in the New York Times by Elizabeth Warren, and she became a violent activist against, as she put it, quote, that awful bill, with a small b, that is, that awful bill. <laughs> and she is credited by Elizabeth Warren with single-handedly keeping this bill from becoming law to her great credit, so to speak. But this statute, like Jason in Friday the 13th, would not go away. So in 2001, it returned, and by now, First Lady Clinton was Senator Clinton. And by now, Senator Clinton had received about $140,000 in contributions from the financial services industry. And so what did she do now? Well, in 2001, she voted for that awful bill twice, supporting it twice. Now, why did she flip? Well, President, uh, First Lady Senator Clinton said, of course, it wasn't the money. Here she is at a blogger's conference defending her decisions. I, I, don't, I don't think, based on my 35 years of fighting for what I believe in, anybody seriously believes I'm going to be influenced by a lobbyist or a particular interest group. Now, now I believe her. You don't get to be Hillary Clinton. You're not that person who Hillary Clinton is. If you could be cor corrupted or forced by money like that to change your view, and indeed, you should believe her as well, because there are millions, I, would, I could list 25 plain reasons why the senator from New York needs to consider this bill differently from the first lady of the United States. So there are plenty of legitimate reasons why she could have chosen to support this bill when before she opposed it. But the point I want you to focus on is, what about others? What are they here? as she explains her decision after they hear that she accepted $140,000 in contributions from financial services companies? Will they trust that she gave the right answer for the right reason? Will they even engage 
in the conversation about why she did what she did. This is an example of what I want to call the dark side of the transparency movement. Given private funding of public elections, this kind of data increases cynicism, increases skepticism about the institution of Congress. Indeed, in California, 88% of citizens believe money buys results in Congress. And right now, Congress stands at the lowest confidence level it has ever had in the history of the American Republic. Indeed, more people likely supported the British Crown at the time of the Revolution than support the United States Congress today. That is a negative consequence to this transparency movement. So I've put these together, these negative and positives, on one page, good and evil, to point you to recognize the way in which this good and evil framing has led to extremes in this debate and extremists in this debate. The extremists on the left of my chart, at least here, increasingly think that the internet teaches us that we need to radically remake society. They look at the copyright debate and they celebrate the fact that copyright is under pressure because of the internet. There's an increasing copyright abolitionist movement out there that believes we should just eliminate copyright. We don't need it anymore. There is no reason for this restriction on freedom to survive. In the context of journalism, they say that blogs will be enough. We don't need major investigative reporting anymore. Amateurs can do everything that we need. And in the context of the trans transparency movement, they look at stories like the growing cynicism and they say it's the just desert to a corrupt system of government. But there's extremism on the right as well. The battle on copyright leads people increasingly to suggest changes that would effectively kill the internet. The death of journalism leads people even more self-righteously to lead to changes that would kill the internet. And those who are embarrassed by the transparency facts that the internet reduce, produces increasingly and in a red China way say, kill the internet. The point is these extremists from both sides refuse to acknowledge the other side. They see this as a grand either or, that we either have the unlimited anarchy that the internet in some sense pushes to, or we have the totalitarian state that those who would resist the internet support. That is a mistake. We need to find a way to pursue both. We need to find a way to believe in the nets, but also believe in copyright and journalism and trust in government. And the question is not which of these to have, the internet or copyright, the internet or, or journalism, the internet or trust. The question is how do we get both? We need to accept the internet is here and not going away. We need to celebrate the internet is here and not going away, but we need to think about how we minimize the harm that this great good gives us. How? Well, there are obvious answers that have been out there for the last 10 years in the context of copyright. To give up the sense that the sole objective of copyright is to give a copyright owner control over how work gets used and to focus instead on ways to assure compensation for the work being used. Compensation for the harm caused by peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. So this is an idea at the center of the book by my colleague Terry Fisher. It's an idea behind the Green Party in Germany's movement for what they call a cultural flat rate that would raise the funds necessary to compensate artists for the harm that they've suffered because of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Or in the context of journalism. My friend and colleague Robert McChesney in this powerful book argues that again we need to recognize the need for public support for public goods and investigative journalism is a public good. So whether through foundations like ProPublica or the government through things like National Public Radio, we need to find ways to complement what the market is providing as historically in the United States we always have. And finally in the context of transparency or what we could call trust. We need to remove the cause of mistrust. We need to change private funding of public elections into public funding of public elections. Small dollar funded elections that would make it 
impossible for people to believe or reasonably to believe that any particular decision was made because of the money, to make it impossible for them to believe as the vast majority believe that money buys results. The point is in all three cases, we accept and we celebrate the internet, but we find ways to accommodate and minimize the harm that the internet pushes. Yet today, in activists and governments across the world, no one is yet pursuing this balanced set of responses. Instead, across the world, extremism in this debate rules. So, for example, in the context of copyright, in the United States, we wage a war. Actually, we wage many wars. So, the copyright war is the particular one I want to speak of. A war which my friend, the late Jack Valenti, former head of the Motion Picture Association of America, used to refer to as his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. Or in the context of journalism, public funding for journalism has been cut in the United States, believing that the private market can provide all that there is, or in the context of trust. Even though the cost of campaigns in the United States has skyrocketed, and members of our Congress spend up to 30 to 70 percent of their time raising money to get reelected to Congress. The Supreme Court of the United States just this year struck down any constitutional basis for Congress to limit corporate spending to support a candidate. Corporations have an unlimited right to spend as much money as they want independent of a campaign to support or oppose any candidate, only exacerbating the current perception that money buys results. We live in this age of extremes. Everywhere we are extremists. We need to learn regulatory humility. The 20th century was this odd century where technology made possible a certain totalitarian way of thinking. Totalizing theories flourished. Technologies like these were first conceived of by governments as tools for propaganda of their citizens. And the 20th century and these technologies launched massively ambitious and often brutal regulations designed to control or remake society. So whether you think of the extremes of Stalin or the extremes of prohibition or the aspirations of FDR or the current war against drugs or the great society of LBJ or the war in Iraq, the mentality is the same. The mentality is the government has the power to control and remake society. And the belief that when its effort to remake slows, the reality is that more force will mean more effective regulation. That relationship, that more force means more effective regulation, is false. In a democracy, not in a totalitarian state, more force often means less effective regulation. As my colleague Cass Sunstein demonstrates, the nudge is often better than the knock. Norms are better than jail. We need to relearn this. All of us need to relearn this. This humility about the potential for government to change the world. Because the extremists have forgotten this on both sides. The extremists on the left, the extremists on the right, they too need to remember the limits to what government can do, the natural constraints within a democracy. These constraints, which need to inspire humility about what government does, especially when you think back to the first point that I made in this talk this morning, point about generations. Because when we recognize that the current war that we wage in the context of internet technology is a war against our kids. We have to recognize the need for this humility. We enforce ever more vigorously restrictions on how they use and behave on the internet and they resist 
these restrictions ever more destructively. What we need to recognize, we, older than Gen Y, we, who don't yet understand what these technologies can do, we need to recognize that you cannot kill these technologies. You can only criminalize them. We can't stop our kids from being creative in ways that none of us, or at least I certainly wasn't when I was growing up. We can only drive that creativity underground. We can't make them passive. We can only make them pirates. And the question we need to ask is, is that any good in my country? Kids live in this age of prohibition. In all sorts of contexts of their life, they live life against the law. That is deeply corrosive, deeply corrupting of the rule of law in a democracy. Internet is freedom. But what is freedom? Freedom is that which begets good and bad. And the mature response to freedom is to minimize the bad to protect the good. And the sane response of any government is to fight no hopeless war. What we need is governments of maturity and sanity, governments that recognize the regulatory humility that the failures of the 20th century should have taught us, not just governments that are young and arrogant, but governments everywhere in the world. Thank you very much.